The Roman Empire The mention of this empire conjures up images of ancient glory and prestige, an association which is well deserved. At its height, the Roman Empire was the greatest empire which had ever existed up to that point. It overcame both the Hellenic and Carthaginian worlds, as well as many other foes, building an empire which stretched from the borders of what is today Scotland to the borders of what is today Iran. Within those boundaries lived an estimated 60 million people, about a fifth of the world's population at the time. Though it peaked nearly 2,000 years ago, its legacy lives on in many obvious ways in the lands it once ruled over, and as a matter of fact, in lands far, far beyond its original boundaries. In the languages, values, religion, culture, laws, and more of billions around the world. The Romans did not simply see themselves as in empire, but rather the empire. Their empire was the true empire of the earth, and they believed that one day all peoples would live under it. As successful as the Romans might have been, however, they were not immortal. By the 3rd century AD, the empire began to show signs of serious problems. Eventually, managing it would become too difficult and it would break in half to be ruled by different administrations. The East would endure throughout the Middle Ages, and is sometimes known as the Byzantine Empire. The Western Empire, however, succumbed to a variety of problems and fell in the year 476 AD. The collapse was so impactful that historians use that year to divide European history between the classical and medieval eras. And indeed, in the subsequent centuries, classical civilization would fade away, to be replaced by medieval society. Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. We have hours of content on this channel in which we go back and look at Roman history and culture, but today we're going to do something different. We are going to bring the Romans to us. That's right, a time portal has just opened from their world to ours, and through it have stepped some of the most famous figures of Roman history. In this video, we are going to explore their adventure in our world. What would they think of us? What would they relate to? Could they get around? Communicate with anyone? Despite how futuristic or frankly godlike we might seem to their ancient eyes, would they understand our civilization and perhaps even be able to warn us of problems that they once faced, some of which led to their collapse? Before we begin, I would like to thank Jessica Powell, Jack Leuchner, Don Beaver, Troy Bishop, Matthias Yokunin, Jordan Prince, Scott Price, Colin Kennedy, and Arcana Natarajan for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join the supporters who make these videos possible. I'd also like to thank all of you out there for bringing this channel to 300,000 subscribers. That's uh, quite a lot of people, and I'm genuinely grateful to every single one of you. And I simply hope that my small contribution to this wonderful community has been useful. Now then, let's get to it. So let's start by establishing a few things about this thought experiment. Firstly, I've done a video like this focusing on medieval monarchs already, which many of you have probably seen. This is not going to be just a repeat of that video. I've argued that the height of Rome was significantly different from medieval Europe, especially Dark Age Europe. Caesar would likely be as stunned as Charlemagne would be over what we call the airplane, the tank, and of course, the toaster, but overall, Caesar would look at us quite differently than Charlemagne would. There are important differences in how they lived and ruled. Secondly, we do have to keep in mind, Rome lasted for a long time, technically over 2200 years from, according to legend, April 21st, 753 BC to May 29th, 1453 AD. We will, however, be focusing on ancient Rome, excluding the medieval Byzantines. Still, it's very important to keep in mind that's over a thousand years of history, a great span of time over which the culture and religion and the politics and society as a whole changed in considerable ways. I think it would be best to narrow it down to characters from Rome's height, the age of its early empire, in order to best compare our civilizations. From the time portal into the year 2020 will step Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Trajan, 
Marcus Aurelius, Diocletian, and Constantine the First. Six legendary figures, but uh, technically five emperors, sorry Julius. We will focus on these six individuals, but we will also draw on the perspectives of other figures as well. Namely those of the average Romans whose names are largely lost, but about whose lives historians do know a fair amount. Well, maybe the year 2020 isn't the best time for them to visit, you know? Actually, on second thought, if a time portal were to open up to ancient Rome, this is definitely the year it would happen. And what better place for this time portal to open than the city of Rome, Italy? As the Italian people go about their business on a seemingly normal day, they're amused by the sudden appearance of historical reenactors who are seen pacing around the streets. However, they quickly become concerned as the supposed reenactors behave erratically. They are overwhelmed and terrified by the environment around them. The cars, the people dressed in strange clothing, the artificial lighting, the unusual language, the technology built by wizards. They fear they have entered the realm of the gods. Eventually, the police are called, and the emperors, after putting up a brief fight which led to Trajan being tased, end up in custody where they wait the opportunity to explain themselves. But could they? How close is the classical Latin that they spoke to modern Italian? Well, Italian is the closest modern language to Latin. Italian, along with languages like French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Romanian, known commonly as the Romantic languages, are sometimes called the Neo-Latin languages because they developed out of Latin vernaculars, called Vulgar Latin. As an imperfect speaker of French, I will say that learning the Latin that I know was easier than it would have been had I not had that experience with French, maybe not so much with regards to the grammar, but definitely as far as vocabulary is concerned, which would be the main thing here for very basic communication with these Italian police officers here. Furthermore, I got similar answers from a few native Italians who I know. They aren't mutually intelligible, there's quite a difference in grammar, but some useful similarities in vocabulary. As a side note, each of these individuals would have been fluent in ancient Greek as well, a language commonly learned by Roman aristocrats and officials. This is because of the influence of the Hellenic world which preceded Rome. Greek was the main language of the eastern half of the empire, in fact, as it had already been spread there by Greek civilization, namely by Alexander's empire and its successor states. Anyway, that's a language which I don't speak myself either, but I have heard, again, from native speakers that it is perhaps even more similar to modern Greek than Italian is to Latin. In summary, the concerned Italian citizens wouldn't be able to understand what they were shouting, but it's likely that the emperors could convey some very basic things to the police officers before they started taking them seriously and a proper translator could arrive. Communication would likely be easier through writing. Literacy rates were relatively high in Rome, at least compared to the Middle Ages, with an estimated 10% of the population of the empire being literate in the year 50 BC, compared to an estimated 1% max literate population in the early Middle Ages of Europe. Anyway, somehow, some way, the translator would deduce that something was quite wrong. And as the incident received greater attention, a team of psychiatrists, historians, biologists, and physicists would eventually deduce that these people had actually traveled through time. As this remarkable news breaks out, the United Nations meets to decide what to do about the situation. The most natural ambassador from their world to ours, I think, would not be too far away. The Pope. The Catholic Church is an organization created by the Romans which survived the collapse of their civilization and carried on into ours, although it is important to note that it was quite different in the age of the Romans and has undergone great changes in its history. Still, it may therefore be a good way of crossing the culture barrier. Plus, the popes generally speak Latin, although the ecclesiastical Latin that the Church uses is different in important ways from classical Latin namely with regards to pronunciation. I suspect ecclesiastical Latin is more commonly taught, at least in the English-speaking world because my Latin pronunciation evidently sounds weird to many of my viewers. Anyway, the thing is though, Rome's Christianization, 
took place long after most of these emperors had lived. The only Christian among the ones here is Constantine. He was the first Christian emperor, though the extent to which he genuinely believed in it is questioned by some historians. Julius Caesar died in 44 BC, before the religion had even begun. Augustus was a contemporary, but died before the series of events had concluded. The emperors between Augustus and Constantine largely knew very little of the religion, viewing it as a strange Jewish cult. It isn't exactly clear how Trajan or Marcus Aurelius viewed it, which is a sign that they gave it little attention. But there were a number, especially later on, who took it upon themselves to persecute Christianity and try to root out its existence, like Diocletian here. They might be surprised to find that it had gained such prominence, with the surprise being greater the earlier back in Roman history you go. With this being one of the best guys they could relate to, however, they might keep their opinions to themselves for the moment. The Romans were relatively tolerant of other religions and tried to incorporate their beliefs into their Roman beliefs whenever possible. But when not possible, they were certainly not against the punishment of heretics who denied things like the deification of certain emperors into the imperial cult. They weren't ever quite as religious as people were in the early modern era, or at least they didn't view religion in the exact same light. Religious, yes, but not quite like us. Furthermore, each of these individuals lived in a time when people were, admittedly, very slowly, taking the religion less seriously anyway, as a part of a much larger shift in values that accompanied the transition of Rome from a republic to an empire. It was not dying out totally, but it's worth mentioning that when Christianity started to become the dominant religion in the 4th century, the pagan zeal was already not what it used to be. They would be disappointed to see, however, that not only had their religion been replaced, but their entire empire had been replaced. The Romans would look at our map, study the countries of the earth and their attributes, and would, at first, be perplexed. To start, how much of the planet were they even aware of? Well, they did know that it was a globe. This was proven by the ancient Greeks. The Romans even sometimes refer to the world as in orbis, Latin for globe. However, they weren't too knowledgeable about the lands well beyond the Mediterranean. They weren't really too huge into exploration, at least not like the Europeans of the early modern era. There are theories that they reached the Americas, but this is extremely unlikely, especially given that they don't seem to really have explored or known much about Sub-Saharan Africa, which is much closer. It also appears to be the case that they knew little of the European tribes not too far beyond their own borders. Their knowledge was greater in the areas through which trade flowed, however. They of course knew of Persia and the Middle East beyond their domain, they had clear, though poorly documented relations with India, and they knew that there was a great power to the Far East which they sometimes called Sina, which the Romans received visitors from and did in fact visit. The Romans even predicted the existence of Australia and Antarctica. Kind of. They essentially thought that there had to be land in the south to serve as a counterweight to the lands in the north, to keep the planet balanced. That's not how the planet works, of course, but they weren't fully wrong about the presence of a terra australis incognita, or an unknown southern land. Regardless, they would be absolutely stunned to see what our world really fully consisted of. But, still, it would be missing something. Them. Our world might remind these Romans more of their earlier Republican history, where Rome was one nation among competing powers, rather than the situation with which these rulers would have been familiar. In the age of these rulers, they ruled over a single empire, with perhaps Persia as a major competitor, but mostly with unimpressive barbarians on their peripheries. These barbarians were certainly regarded as dangerous, but not equals in terms of social and technological achievement. To the emperors of Rome's golden age, as I mentioned, Rome was simply THE empire. There were no rivals. There were setbacks and troubles, but the Romans had confidence that their empire would, with time, 
rule over the entire world. They would be faced with the fact that not only is this not the case, but that there isn't even a clear successor to Rome in our world. There are many states which could be called successors to Rome in a certain light, but none which continue on Roman civilization itself. Rome fell for good in 1453 AD. There were other claimants to the title of Rome, in the sense of carrying on Roman civilization, or at least some aspect of it, like the Holy Roman Empire, Tsarist Russia, and even the Ottomans, but now not even those countries claim the title of Roman. The absolute closest you would get to a group legitimately identifying as Romans, apart from maybe the Catholic Church, would be the Greeks living in Anatolia, who have referred to themselves as Romans all the way back to Rome, and continue to, to this day. But is there really an equivalent to Rome in our world? Not exactly. You've had empires since, like the British Empire, which was, frankly, more accomplished than Rome in many ways, which would doubtlessly have impressed the Romans. You also have massively powerful and influential nations around today, namely the United States, with whom the Romans could perhaps relate in some ways. They may see the United States and its history like they saw the Rome, a humble, small nation which had thrown off a monarchy and created a democracy, eventually ruling over a great continent-spanning empire. But our world is not the Roman world, and much of our world would simply not make sense to them, especially when you look at something like international relations. Indeed, the concept of people interacting so closely and quickly with each other on a global scale would be utterly amazing to them. Not only is this the case for governments and politicians, but average people. Today, for example, the information in this video is being transferred to thousands of people across the globe at the speed of light, minus the strength of your internet connection. As mentioned in the medieval video, traveling from one end of the Roman Empire, Britannia, to another, Aegyptus, could take about two months on average. Messengers could move faster, armies would move more slowly. However, it's worth pointing out that the Romans, especially these Romans, were a bit more accustomed to the concept of safe, long-distance travel. The Romans had very extensive trade networks, which spanned the known world, and an impressive system of roads. Though they would be stunned by our road systems, and would marvel at the vehicles traveling on them at speeds which they could never have achieved, they would recognize the setup. The Romans also ruled over the whole Mediterranean by the time of Augustus. They referred to it as Mare Nostrum, our sea, and were very efficient in keeping it pirate-free. While the empire was not as linguistically united under Latin and Greek as is often believed, if you knew one of these languages then you could get around fairly well anywhere. Travel could be dangerous, however, and there was a bit of banditry. Speaking of crime, would the Romans be impressed with our system of police, firefighters, and other emergency personnel? Did they have equivalents? Yes, though not on our scale, of course. I covered this in a video which I think is a little underrated, maybe I'm biased, I don't know, I found that interesting. The first firefighting force in Rome was a private brigade run by Marcus Licinius Crassus, who would go around saving the citizens of the city of Rome from devastating fires. If the owners sold the property to him at a substantial discount right there on the spot, and agreed to have it loaned back to them. If they refused, then Crassus would likely just cite one of the Ferengi rules of acquisition or something, and leave. Decades later, however, the first public fire brigade in the city of Rome was founded under Augustus. They were called the Wigiles, related to our word vigilance. This force would later double as police officers and include paramedics. It would also spread to other major cities. However, the world outside these cities was still as dangerous, and banditry was generally the responsibility of the military. Clearly, quite a bit would be different to these visitors, and we've only touched the surface on many things we consider fundamental to our daily lives and take for granted, but which they would find quite shocking, amazing, or both. Perhaps the best way for these emperors to figure out these differences would be for them to get out in the world and see it for themselves, experiencing it from one of our perspectives. 
Indeed, such ambitious and intelligent individuals wouldn't want to stand around as a living museum exhibit all day. As their journeys continued, eventually they would make their way to America, where they would want to come into contact with Justin, the guy who runs the YouTube history channel Fire of Learning, a channel whose videos they quite enjoyed and to which they of course subscribed as soon as they understood the concept of subscription, and YouTube, and internet. Perhaps the best way for them to understand how we live, I would conclude, would be to get them a job. Yep, just fill this out and I'll get it to the manager. Gratias Tibiago, Justine. Alright. Name? Kaiser Nerwa Trianos. Birth? September 18th, 53. Place of birth? The city of Italica in the province of Hispania Baetica. Past employers? The Senate and people of Rome? Position? Emperor? Salary? Oh, I'd have to consult the tax records. Hi, excuse me, I have a question. How can I be of assistance? Where are your tomatoes? I don't know. I am sorry, ma'am. I shall have to ask. You work here and you don't know where your tomatoes are? I do not know this thing. Tomato. You don't know what a tomato is? Where are you from that they don't have tomatoes? Italy. Are you kidding me? Okay, go talk to your manager before I talk to him for you. I apologize, ma'am. I will be right back. The tomatoes are in aisle A2. Indeed, the Romans would not have been familiar with tomatoes, nor a great many things, typical to our diets which came from the Americas, Asia, and Africa. Tomatoes, for example, came from the Americas. Hernan Cortes is believed to have been responsible for introducing them to Europe and the rest of the world in the late 1490s. The typical Roman diet was not bland, however, even by our standards. There was, of course, all kinds of variation from region to region, but the typical diet shares many similarities with the modern Mediterranean diet. Cereals like wheat, barley, emmer, and the things made from them, i.e. bread, or in Latin, panum, and porridge, were absolutely essential. Dairy products like milk and cheese and things like that were of course common as well. You also had a healthy amount of fruits and vegetables. The most famous of all, of course, are olives, and the olive oil made from it. Of equal fame are grapes, from which wine, very common in the Roman diet, was made. The Romans weren't alcoholics, though. Well, not most of them anyway, and the actual alcohol content of their wine was often diluted. You also had peas and beans and other types of legumes, onions, lettuce, radishes, cucumbers, garlic, asparagus, mushrooms, apples, pears, dates, turnips, and cabbages. Recall, of course, Diocletian here retired to be a cabbage farmer, and it was the Romans who invented apple bobbing. Honey was used for a variety of reasons, for both preservation and as a sweetener. There was also, of course, meat, but it was expensive, and the average Roman ate less of it than we do today. Pork, poultry, veal, rabbit, mutton, and beef were all common, but were you to be invited to a dinner party at an aristocrat's house, you could find yourself having roast ostrich for dinner. Seafood was also common, but could be expensive. As far as condiments go, the big one was called garum, a kind of fermented fish sauce. As a side note, the whole vomiting at meals to consume even more food is not only gross, but also not true. What is true, however, is that the Romans appear to have established the concept of fast food, or takeout. They had establishments called thermopolia, where you could purchase hot, pre-made food. They even had names, Burger Rex and Filius Donaldis. I'm joking about the names. Despite all this, the Romans would no doubt be impressed by the huge variety of foods available to our modern diet. Hello ma'am, did you find everything alright? No, actually, I had some trouble finding your tomatoes, and the employee who I asked for help was very rude, very inconsiderate, and didn't even know where they were. I'm sorry about that ma'am. Were you able to find them though? Yes, after wasting a huge amount of my time. I think I'm entitled to a discount. Perhaps so. I shall go and ask my manager if I can give you a discount on your tomatoes. Uh, no. I mean a discount on everything. Everything. Why everything? Yeah, 
The experience was very stressful, ridiculous, it's not right how I was treated, and I might have to take my business somewhere else from now on if it isn't corrected. You should not let such trivial incidents defeat you. Ah, uh, excuse me? You have control over your own mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. What are you talking about? What I mean to say is that very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. When you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. Oh my god, everyone who works here is a freak, goodbye. What would the Romans think of our family units, marriage, childbearing, and things like that? The Romans had a very complex family system, one which might seem strange to us and would require a video of its own to explain, frankly. Roman women had much less control over their lives than women today, as one would expect, but in fact even less than medieval women. Women were expected to follow the wishes of the head males of the family, the pater familias, be it father, brother, grandfather, husband, or whoever held that role. Sociosexuality was heavily regulated. These rules did relax a bit in late ancient Rome, however, as the values shifted. There was never an empress who held power in ancient Rome, though this changed in Byzantium, but in the late empire there were women who occasionally controlled things from behind the scenes, such as Yulia Maisa, who directed things during the reigns of her grandsons Elagabalus and Severus Alexander. Like a majority of societies around the world, marriages were often arranged. Love and looks and liking each other was important to the Romans, but not nearly as important as creating childbearing arrangements and cementing relations between families. Whether a marriage would benefit a family, or bring it dishonor and trouble, was taken into heavy consideration. Many Westerners today would find this practice backward, but they likely would see our marriages as being selfish and too focused on an individual's happiness, rather than the welfare of the family and broader society. The Romans were not as individualistic as modern Westerners tend to be. Women were often married off in their early teenage years to men in their 20s. Men were not free from the duties of the family either, and generally had to listen to the paterfamilias as well. The concept of children being expected to move out, sometimes going great distances and breaking some ties with their family, would have been a bit foreign to the very close-knit Roman families. In summary, they would see modern people and the way they go about their relationships about how you would expect dangerously libertine. Women were expected, above all else, to bear children and were quite proud of being successful mothers. It was certainly not easy. Childbirth was the leading cause of death for women for much of history. Roman women faced perhaps a 5-10% to chance of dying in childbirth. After that, the child faced about a 50% chance of death within their first few birthdays. The upper classes had it a bit easier, but the lower classes would have seen a majority of children not make it. Comparatively, modern child mortality rates in developed countries are about 1%. Today we can thankfully treat many disorders children are born with. Those which are considered mild to us could have been a death sentence in ancient Rome. Then, after that, children had to be approved of by the pater familias. He made the decision on whether or not to keep a child or to abandon it, and abandonment did take place. These children were often left to a dark fate, and at best might have been brought in and raised by slave traders. Men, especially of the lower classes, often did harsh and dangerous work, the most dangerous of all of course being the empire's constant wars. All the while, all of Roman society was plagued by occasional outbreaks of disease and famines. While the Romans took a proto-scientific approach to healthcare for their day, again, they had no way of treating many ailments. The essential point here, this was a society with what's called a high mortality salience, much more so than our own. Death was a normal part of life, and likely, as we discussed in our medieval video, the Romans would be stunned by how many people were blessed with a relatively untroubled childhood and comparatively long and pleasant life. P. 
People were considered adults by their teenage years, but while a 15-year-old might have been considered an adult technically, the Romans were fully aware of and often commented on the fact that what we call adolescence, especially males, tended to be rash, wild, and foolhardy, and did not trust them with certain assignments and positions until their early 20s. The word senator, for example, shares the same root as the word senile, the Latin word senex, relating to age. This is because the Romans felt it best that they were governed by older, experienced men. Many countries share this perspective today. For example, the age requirement to be president of the United States is 35. The Romans would be stunned by our very large education systems. In many developed countries, education is a requirement. There were schools and private tutors for children in Rome, but these were reserved for people who could afford them. Both girls and boys were educated, but boys received a much more extensive education. The rest of the population was simply trained in a trade or something along those lines. Overall, most people had less freedom than we do today to decide what they wanted to do with their lives. They would also be amazed by how available knowledge is to someone seeking it out in the developed world. At worst, much of what you want to know can be found by traveling to the local library, but for most people, we carry around enormous libraries in our pockets. It's difficult to work out what the exact population of the empire was at its height, despite how organized the Romans were with regards to taking things like censuses, much more so than their medieval descendants. However, the best guesses are somewhere between 50 million and 100 million, again at its height, with many experts leaning somewhere around 60 million. Today, Italy alone has 60 million inhabitants, and there are a little under 700 million people living in the former borders of the empire altogether. We pointed out in the medieval video that many medieval monarchs would be stunned by the size of our cities. And indeed, the Romans would also marvel at the populations we could sustain today as well, but some of their cities were large even by our standards. Rome, for example, perhaps boasted a population of a million people at its height, a little over a third of the city's current population. Constantinople, too, had about half a million residents. These cities were kept functioning by things like well-organized food production, plumbing systems which brought water into the cities and brought waste out, clear forethought on the part of city planners, a well-established and enforced system of laws, and the aforementioned emergency services. In that respect, they were a bit closer to us than our medieval ancestors. These cities would be quite noticeably dirty compared to ours, however, and more dangerous. Buildings could be large, but were susceptible to fires and collapse. And what would these Romans look like? Well, the Romans have left us a lot of useful evidence to work out how they looked in the form of literary descriptions, artwork, and the famous busts. These have been quite useful in allowing anatomically inclined artists to produce some very good guesses as to what many specific individuals looked like in real life, which is very cool and absolutely worth looking into. If we really wanted to, I suppose we could find out by analyzing Roman genomes. As one might expect, ancient Italians look like modern Italians, and it seems to be the case that this is the standard across the empire's many regions. There are some differences, however, one of which is vertical. The Romans were a bit shorter than us. Skeletal remains show that ancient Italian males were, on average, about 5 foot 5 or 5 foot 6, or 1.65 meters. Women would have been shorter. The Romans described the barbarians north of them as tall, as they were about 5 foot 9 on average, or about 1.75 meters, which is the average height of a modern Italian male. Likewise, another difference was horizontal. Today, about 20% of Italians are overweight. This is quite low, actually, compared to other developed countries, but certainly higher than the Romans. The average Roman would have been walking everywhere, eating a simpler diet, and doing strenuous activities throughout the day. Very few people would have been living what we call a sedentary lifestyle. Even among the upper classes, it seems that very few emperors were obese at all. Very briefly, I would like to interrupt and take a moment to shamelessly self-promote. 
I've started a second YouTube channel called Lucinox, where we focus on science. I've recently made a documentary about extraterrestrial life and what it might be like if and when we encounter it. If that's something that might interest you, there will be a link to it in the description. If not, that's cool too. Back to the video. The Romans were clearly into music, much as we are today. Were these Romans to listen to modern music, they would be able to say, with more right than anyone else alive, that heh, they don't make it like they used to. <sighs> Though we know that the Romans quite enjoyed music, and we know a fair amount about what it sounded like based off of the designs of their instruments, we don't have clear, specific records of a whole lot. Much of the Roman sound, unfortunately, disappeared along with them. Moving into war, the Romans valued peace, as we do, but firmly believed that warfare and conquest was not simply a part of life, but essential to who they were as a people. The Romans would almost certainly be very impressed by the modern militaries of our countries and hold great admiration for the technologies they wield. In fact, they might be surprised that certain countries weren't making more use of these militaries. What exactly they would think of things like nuclear weapons, however, well, who could say? The Romans were not afraid to assault non-combatants, and do whatever it took to obtain success for the Empire, but they might feel that such weapons could be too destructive, just as many people today fear. Perhaps they Nuke would- Nuke Arminius. What? Nuke Arminius. Chill. As far as our governments go, though these emperors had reigned as monarchs, beginning with Julius Caesar overthrowing the Republic to Diocletian and Constantine, who more closely resembled medieval absolute monarchs, they had a soft spot for democracy, as Romans tended to, and may be pleased to see that a system similar to the one of the Roman Republic had survived so well. Our terms for these things even came from the ancients, like Republic, which came from them, and their term res publica, Latin for the public thing, and the Greek demokratia, meaning rule of the people. However, our democracies are quite different from theirs. This too would deserve a video of its own, it's quite complicated and changed throughout time, but essentially, the Romans had a much more rigid class system, and suffrage was limited to only adult male citizens, the patricians and plebeians. Not all people were citizens, and it wasn't until 212 AD, under Caracalla, that citizenship expanded to all freemen in the empire. The lowest order, slaves, could never vote. I mean, you know, how often can slaves vote? Of the citizens, not all votes were regarded as equal either, and those who were more wealthy and powerful in society had more power in politics. And now, perhaps, the great question. As these Romans spent months, years even, adapting to and studying our civilization, would they be able to offer us any advice? None of these emperors reigned over Rome in its absolute final days, but Diocletian and Constantine did rule over a troubled empire and struggled to hold it together. Might they be able to recognize flaws or problems with our society that, once they understood what happened to theirs, they would realize lead to the destruction of civilizations? This is a very popular topic among historians, some of whom seek out similarities between us and Rome to prevent meeting the same fate. What could they warn us of? Well, ultimately, of course, that's really an answer only they could give. One of the great lessons of history is that it repeats, and the great value in studying history is in learning to avoid making the same mistakes again. This is a view which I have shared many times on this channel, and which is something many students of history come to realize. However, I believe it also needs to be said that our civilization is significantly different from Rome. In many ways, modern civilization has gone light years beyond what anyone else ever has. Many of the problems we face in today's world are unique to us. No one else has been here before. Once they understood the issues we face, they would be as stumped and perhaps divided as we are. While learning from history is important, the truth is, we will have to figure out some things for ourselves. 
Furthermore, civilization is a process, for lack of a better word, a creation which outlasts us. It's much bigger than any of us, any single generation. We have inherited what we have today from our ancestors, we will make our contribution, and we will pass it off to future generations when we die. This is true of all civilizations. No one lives to see the whole thing through. It's sometimes easy to forget that when looking at these civilizations of history because we weren't there. Our understanding of Rome comes to us through text in books or very wonderful YouTube videos which cram centuries, numerous lifetimes, into ours. Roman civilization fell very slowly, taking many generations. Some historians date the beginning of the decline as far back as the downfall of the Republic and transition into Empire, a period of about 500 years. It's paradoxical because this is when Rome achieved its apex, but there are some points to this argument when we think of a collapse as a very broad process rather than the final stage when things get obviously bad beyond repair. Certainly, the process of collapse seems to have begun following the Golden Age in about 180 AD, when Commodus became emperor. Point being, because of all this, their opinions of our world may be less useful than we would have hoped. They would read our history books and discover what happened to Rome in the centuries after their death, and while they may be able to offer important insights, as I said, having taken part in much of this, they too would be limited in understanding these grand processes. But humans are humans, they would see that in us, and we would see that in them. So again, it wouldn't be surprising at all if they were able to come to some very insightful conclusions about the world, from having lived in two civilizations, were they to come through this time portal. This may seem like a trivial thought experiment to some, something which will almost certainly never happen, and therefore there is no point in dedicating thought to these types of things. But I believe that when we place ourselves next to the Romans or any other civilization as best as we possibly can in a scenario like this, it provides a lot of important insight into understanding them, ourselves, and humanity as a whole. And that is what history is all about. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Like I said, we did a similar video on medieval monarchs which you might enjoy as well. You can help support the production of videos like these by donating to us on Patreon, the link to which is in the description. I'd like to thank our current patrons once again listed here for their support. We are also on Instagram and Twitter, so come check us out there too. Thank you for watching.